In chapter 8, we're going to be looking at properties of a circle, and in particular, angles. And we're going to start off with um, looking at properties of tangents to a circle. So the word tangent comes from the Latin tangere, which just means to touch. So you can think of a tangent as a line that just touches a circle. It doesn't cross through the circle, in which case it would have two points of intersection. Uh, and it doesn't miss the circle altogether, it just touches it. So there's only one single point where the tangent touches the circle, and that's known as the point of tangency. And in the diagram there, it's labeled with a P. Um, in this diagram, O is the center of the circle, so OP is the radius of the circle. And we can talk about the tangent line AB, um, and we can also talk about the angles formed by uh, a arbitrary point on the line and the point of tangency P and the center of the circle. So I can refer to that as either APO, angle APO, or angle BPO. And in both cases it's 90 degrees. And this is a fundamental property of tangents to a circle. They always form an angle of 90 degrees or a right angle with the radius of the circle when you draw the radius from the center of the circle to the point of tangency. Now, later on, you're going to see different types of tangents, uh, in particular a tangent to a curve, where the line is uh, just touching the curve. But because of the nature of curves, it might actually cross the uh, curve later on. And these sorts of tangents are going to be a fundamental object of uh, examination in calculus. Uh, but for now, we're just looking at tangents to a circle. So you can think of a tangent as a line that just touches the circle in one place and one place only. And because we have that right angle formed, we're going to have lots of problems that uh, we can explore that involve right angles or right triangles. So for instance, the uh, circle below, we have uh, a radius, and then we have uh, a right triangle formed by uh, a tangent, and we have uh, the hypotenuse of that right triangle drawn in. Now. If we know that uh, one of the angles, that central angle at the radius is 70 degrees, we can figure out what the one missing angle is. And I've labeled it with a Greek letter. It's pronounced theta. So this Greek letter here is um, pronounced theta. And Greek letters are often used as variables for angles. They don't have to be. We could just as easily have used x or y or z but uh, I thought I would get you used to seeing some Greek letters. So how do we find theta? Well, we know that the three angles in any triangle add up to 180 degrees. So we know that theta plus 70 plus 90, the right angle, has to add up to 180. Uh, a simpler way when you're dealing with right triangles is if we just subtract 90 from both sides here, we know that theta plus 70 must equal 90 because we have uh, already have one angle that's equal to 90. So the other two must add up to 90. And so clearly we can just subtract 70 from both sides and we get theta equal to 20 degrees here. All right, now there's all sorts of other right triangle problems we can look at. So here's one where <clears throat> we have a, a line of tangency or a segment that's tangent to the circle. And that's given as a, having a length of 40. The line segment has a length of 40. And then the radius is given as a 30. So in this case, the 30 and the 40 are legs of a right triangle. And we can remember Pythagoras and figure out what the hypotenuse of that right triangle is. And the hypotenuse of the right triangle goes all the way from the center of the circle to the vertex of the right triangle. So let's figure out what h is before we figure out what x is. So we know that h squared is equal to 30 squared plus 40 squared, right? That's true of all right triangles. The square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the two legs of the right triangle. And in this case, that's 900 and 1600. Add them together, you get 2500. And so if h squared is equal to 2500, then h is equal to the square root of 2500. And that's equal to exactly 50. And if you can see that if you have a right triangle with legs of 30 and 40, you're going to have a hypotenuse of 50. That's just uh, an example of a Pythagorean triple, 3, 4, 5. We can take 
uh, right triangle with legs 3 and 4, it's going to have a hypotenuse of 5 because 3 squared, which is 9, plus 4 squared, which is 16, is equal to 5 squared, which is 25. And you can take that 3, 4, 5 right triangle and multiply each side by the same number. In this case, we've multiplied each by 10. So we're closer to figuring out what x is because now we know that h is equal to 50. How do we figure out what x is? Well, it's always important to remember sort of certain obvious things with circles. Um, but quite often it's really easy to kind of overlook the obvious with these uh, geometric figures. And the obvious fact we want to remember here is that any line segment connecting the center of the circle to the edge of the circle or to the circle itself is a radius. And therefore all radii have the same length. And since we already know the radius in this diagram is 30, the other radius or any other radius we draw is also 30. And so now we know that 30 plus x is equal to h, which we just figured out, which is 50. And so therefore we can just subtract 30 from both sides and we get x equal to 20. Now, there are actually some very interesting real world problems that we can answer using this same um, property of the right triangle here. So the diagram here is uh, has some sort of great exaggerations here, but you'll see why uh, in a second. Let's imagine that this is a cross-section of the Earth. So the, the radius in this case is the radius of the Earth. I'm just going to symbolize that as RE. And we have that same radius over here, RE. And imagine that at the top of this diagram we have a plane. So the plane is flying above the surface of the Earth. And usually we talk about the height or that particular height is the altitude, so we'll label this as A. So the question is, if you are in a plane flying at some altitude, and let's say you're flying over the ocean, uh, so there's no mountain ranges to complicate matters here, and we're also making an assumption that the Earth is a perfect sphere, which isn't quite true, uh, but for our purposes it's going to be close enough. So the question becomes, Let's say you're flying over the middle of the Pacific. You're on your way from Vancouver to Japan, for instance. Um, how far away is the horizon? So if you could look out the window and see the horizon, uh, the ocean, um, far in the distance, well, how far away is that point? So we'll label this D. And you can see you've got a right triangle there. Let's see what that um, is. So we have RE the radius of the Earth squared plus d squared. So those are the two legs of the right triangle. That's going to be equal to the hypotenuse, which is the radius of the Earth plus the altitude of the plane squared. So that's our Pythagorean um, formula right there. And what we would ultimately like to know is d. So let's subtract uh, the first term there, re squared, from both sides. So we have RE plus A squared minus RE squared. And we can go a little further. We can say, well, we're actually interested in D, so let's take the square root of both sides. And we get the square root of RE plus A squared minus RE squared. So now we have everything we need. We can plug all this into a calculator if we just know the actual values to plug in. And for the purposes of this problem, let's say the radius of the Earth is 6,378.1 kilometers. Now that's the average radius of the Earth. Obviously, you know, mountain ranges make things uh, more complicated. And as I said, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It actually is uh, it's called an oblate sphere, which means it's kind of been flattened at the poles. But for our purposes, this is going to be good enough. And the altitude, the altitude of a plane. Well, obviously, planes can fly at a variety of altitudes. I went online and found the uh, maximum altitude that a Boeing 787 Dreamliner can fly at. And that turns out to be 13.1 kilometer. Now, you can see why this is a great exaggeration for the diagram. Obviously, that 13 kilometers would basically be totally insignificant compared to the radius of the Earth. So the diagram we have is an exaggeration, but the properties uh, stay exactly the same. Uh, and we could just as easily be calculating this for a 
a satellite, for instance, which is uh, maybe thousands of kilometers above the Earth's surface, or maybe even just a few hundred. So let's take a look. Let's plug all this in and see what we get for D. So the distance equal to 6,378.1 plus 13.1 squared minus 6,378.1 squared. And when you plug that into a calculator, you get approximately 409 kilometers. So if you were able to look out the window and see the horizon, it's going to be about 400 kilometers away. And if you went to the other side of the plane and looked out, the horizon on the other side would be about 400 kilometers away. If somehow you could sit on top of the plane and get a nice 360 degree view, you'd be looking at a uh, sort of a patch of the Earth that's roughly the shape of a circle with a radius of 409 kilometers. So that's a pretty big chunk of the ocean, but when you think that the uh, Pacific is thousands of kilometers across, you're really not really seeing all that much of it. Now, you get to see a lot of the ocean if you're in a plane, but let's imagine you were sailing across the Pacific, and let's say you were sailing in a uh, small sailing boat, maybe a 40-footer or 50-footer, if you're standing on the deck of that boat, your eyes might only be about 3 meters above the surface of the ocean. So if you were 3 meters above the surface, how far away would the horizon be? And this might be of uh, actually quite important um, safety significance, because if you're out in the middle of the ocean, um, you'd kind of like to know how much head... Um, how much time you'd have before you uh, hit something. So it's kind of nice to know how far away the horizon is. So let's just do this calculation again. This time the altitude is going to be a lot smaller, only 3 meters. We need the units to be the same though, so let's turn 3 meters into 0 0.003 kilometers. And now we can do the calculation again. We get D equal to 6,378.1 plus 0 0.003 squared minus 6378.1 squared. And this might look like it's going to come out to zero because those two numbers, when you're squaring them, are so close to one another. But it turns out you actually do get a meaningful result. And it turns out to be 6.2. So 6.2 kilometers. So that means if you're standing on the deck of your small sailing boat and you're looking towards the horizon, it is only 6.2 kilometers away. And that means that um, boats can appear and be right up beside you very quickly. And uh, if you're planning to go to sleep, um, you're going to want to have some kind of alarm system that will detect a boat getting close to you because really the horizon is very close to you.